Hi, my name is Hakan Topal. Um, I'm glad to be here. And tomorrow morning we'll have a lecture. Who's presenting? <laughs> Hope you're ready. Um, I would like to thank Mark Tribe and uh, SVA MFA program for organizing this lecture. I think it was a great idea. And I, I see that all of you are forced to be here, so which is great. <laughs> I was like thrilled that I was like, oh my God, everybody want to hear me. And then Mark told me that, no, no, they have to be here. So, so nevertheless, it's great. And I'm very happy, glad to be here to present my, some of my work. And I realized that I was going through all of the slides and I thought that like, uh, if I start talking about the projects, it's going to be like uh, till morning, we'll talk about the issues. And we hate that kind of presentations. We want to be focused, short. And so um, I selected like four or five uh, projects. Um, first, I would like to say that sometimes um, I say we. Like although I'm presenting as Hakan Topal, I did a lot of uh, projects. So when I say we, uh, I do not mean it's a royal we, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's... <laughs> Because uh, since, uh, since 2000, um, I worked collaboratively. And even before, I did a lot of collaborative works. Some of the works uh, I did individually. <laughs> Some of the works uh, uh, I did more than two people. So some of the projects that I'm going to show you today, and I, I will say we. When I say we, I will say we as a collective that would like to do something in the world change something. So the reason that I started as an art, um, as an artist, even like started doing projects um, when I was little. <laughs> 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 I, I don't want to go there. To, to <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about my childhood, obviously. Uh, people that who, who are in my classes understand that I hate that kind of like a traumas and etc. All of us has traumas and I'm I'm sure um, I do have some, and I don't want to know about them because I'm more interested in the political nature, like uh, in, in terms of the, um, what I can do, what I can say as an adult, as a citizen, as an artist in life. So when I was a, st a student, I started uh, taking uh, photographs, and I was an engineering student, and I wanted to be a magnum photographer. So that was my goal, basically. Like I had a camera, we had dark rooms, and I was looking all these like amazing pictures that Magnum photographers took, and I wanted to go those places, feel and experience those moments, and I wanted to do pictures. And I did some pictures. I went to uh, sites like Turk Turkmenistan. This is the coal mine. Um, I'm not showing all the photographs, obviously. Um, so, um, but I was very active as a student, as an activist at the university, which is in Ankara. Middle East Technical University, one of the universities like Berkeley in the US. So as a student, um, uh, students are very active in the political, um, they have a really strong agency, I would say. Then I st and then we were thinking that what can we do with these photographs? And we kind of realized that photography is kind of a dead discipline, right? Photography does, I mean, you all read Bard. Photography does not mean anything if, I, if there is no caption. Or you can take a photograph, you can use it any way you want with its proper caption. So I decided that if photography was not enough, I had to do some uh, direct action. And the performances, of course, we were aware of the, all the performances, especially the Chris Burden, Vito Aconci, and then later on Rebecca Horn. Like as, a, as an engineering student, seeing those work and understanding that the <laughs> The actually, the direct action was more interesting for me than going taking uh, pictures. But uh, eventually, these um, these performances were influenced uh, through my uh, photographic experiences. Right? There's, I, I guess uh, that Susan Sontag says photography is not about showing something; it's about learning how to see. Right? You you look at the world. We look at the same thing. We see different things. So actually, photography taught me in a way that to see, to experience things that I would otherwise never experience. So um, I did, this was the performance that, so still I'm a baby there, right? So uh, like I'm learning and I'm understanding what the 
contemporary art is, and also I'm trying to understand what my, my limits of my political agency, limits of my political agency is, right? So when I did this performance, my friends said that you're a petit bourgeois, you're bullshitting yourself, etc. Like I get, I had like really harsh criticism, and I had to really think about like what I was doing as an artist and activist, like a kind of a this uh, dilemma, right? So, but nevertheless, I I'm still thinking that the art has a, its own place. And um, recently, I was um, reading an interview by um, a Turkish poet, Muratan Mungan. He said that literature creates its own space. That was a, such a beautiful, like, saying, right? Literature is not something, is not nothing to do with the political system or political space or engineering space, architectural space. Literature creates its own space. So I feel like art is something like that. You create a space, a temporary space that in which you can start thinking. Um, Anyway, I did some other performances. This, this performance was called Power Pumps. I get a plunger, and then I, I did some, um, uh, like a, this was a more somewhat theatrical in a way that I read um, fatwas to young ladies. Uh, it was um, Hadith, uh, you know Hadith maybe, it's the sayings of Prophet, right? Muhammad's sayings. It's like Chris living, right? So sayings of prophet are not as good as the Quran, but it's a supplementary. So through the pr uh, like a hadiths, you can define every little aspect of life. There are 6,000 verified hadiths in Islam. And through these hadiths, you can tell people how to masturbate, how to take shower, how, how to clip their nails. That detailed, right? I was very interested in the idea of this usage of, because Quran is very limited, like there are 300 articles, it is like a political, it's like a constitution. Whereas Hadith, it's like a, it's a legislation, right? You legislate the life through this Hadith. So I selected really, really funny ones. That's like a, about masturbation, like you should, should you masturbate with left hand or right hand, right? This is a question that was addressed by Muhammad. Like, or like, Address not directly, of course, say, saying that you cannot do bad things with your right hand. So you have to masturbate with your left hand, right? Things like that. You have to, there are like a, this, because the hermeneutics is about the understanding of the secret, sacred text. So you actually understand the sacred text by interpretation. So if you cannot do um, bad things with your right hand, therefore you have to masturbate with your left hand. Anyway, so I'm not going to, and I'm not going to show this video. This was an earlier work. So I'm going to show mostly like a current work means that after like 2000 and 99 there was a big earthquake in Turkey and 20,000 people died. So this was a kind of a turning point um, uh, for me because I went there, I was working as a um, researcher at the university and we, I went there with the engineers to go each site that was I think 300 kilometers long fault line there were like 20,000 people died. Second day we were there, we start taking pictures. So I start questioning about the idea of the state. What does state do, right? What does it mean to be secure or safe in this context? And uh, I, I think today these questions are much more relevant. Think about the hur Hurricane Katrina or Sandy, like things that like we, especially Katrina, it, I felt that very similar. There are similarities, right? George Bush could not um, properly handle the disaster, and then the, all the class inequalities and the disc uh, discrepancies emerges from these catastrophes. So I started to do interested in this collapse <coughs> moment, right? Total collapse. The society collapses. Even the military cannot communicate each other. So at that point. Um, something um, very interesting happened, right? The civil society kind of emerged and people start to organize. And um, this happened in Gezi too, right? Because there's, a, there's something, when there's catastrophic, something catastrophic happens, all the institutions, social institutions collapses or cannot even address the social issues or the humanitarian issues 
And suddenly the, the, the society, the leftovers, uh, start to organize themselves. Th and then this was a very, very powerful thing for me to experience that moment. Right? These are some of the pictures that uh, I took. And in, two in, uh, in 2000, now I say we, I start working with uh, Güven Incirlioğlu, who's, um, who's currently in um, Izmir, who's, who was teaching in Istanbul at the time. And we start collaborating, and I moved to, uh, uh, from Ankara to New York in 2000, and we start collaborating online. And, but in 99, we visited all these sites together, and then we were invited to uh, an exhibition. It's um, a safe, like a, they co converted an old bank safe room into an exhibition space. So we felt that it was a kind of a, uh, both metaphorically and literally had like a relationship with the idea of the safety and the collapse of the older uh, like the buildings, right? And um, <laughs> so these are some of the other photographs. And in the exhibition space, we, uh, we exhibited um, three sets of uh, large format photographs taken with four by five. And these are the after a year these are the, all the buildings that were dumped. So like whatever the leftovers, like if you think about the, after, after the war, all the collapsed building, they, they put in a dump area. So we felt that that's kind of a, that, that forms a kind of a stratification of this like human experience, right? All these buildings kind of put leftovers, put on top of each other. So, and then in the exhibition space, this was a safe, we decided to incorporate the space inside the space. So we built that interactive 3D model of the room itself. And then in the, inside this 3D, you could uh, interact with the mouse. It, uh, and um, you could see the other photographs that was not presented in the um, pictures. We projected the model on top of the um, limestone powder. And limestone powder was, was used to cover the dead people so that they don't get rotten or smell or uh, the, like spread the diseases, right? So the limes, that is like a presented on the limestone powder as a kind of a topo topography. And all these like pictures were portraits of the dead people. So we felt that it was a kind of a something that cannot be presented within an actuality in a way that, I mean, uh, that was a kind of an artistic decision. I mean, I, I'm not sure I would do the same thing right now, but um, we felt that that kind of a, because in the uh, actual walls, we did not present any kind of portraitures or human experience or any, you just see the dump like landscape basically, like collapsed landscape. Uh, text, writing, photographing, video, or the performative or speaking has its own way of producing space like the way that literature pr provide p creates space right so and i feel like um, although I, I was so much i was so critical to photography i i could never cut myself out of it just like um, a writer hates writing right so you you hate it but you have to do it in a way that to, because this is the only thing that you can do in a way um but the like a performative aspect is always because of the dialogue. Because when I say we, because there's this <coughs> always this dialogue that happens before when the we produce something, right? Because uh, you have to interact. Like um, before you produce, you have to talk, and you have to like explain yourself um, to the other person. You have to convince that person that an aesthetic strategy is going to work. And how you are going to do that? Because you didn't do the work. So that, that's kind of like, that, that also for me is a performative, right? You cannot just simply explain things in words. There's always like this gap between the explaining or like, or the, the other person understanding and un getting it, right? So for the this 2001 confessions strong from East West, uh, we were invited for the to represent with a bunch of other artists to represent the Turkish um, uh, Turkey in Venice Biennial. So I was, uh, Güven actually originally was invited, but we were collaborating. So he said that we should do this as exurban collective. And then, um, excuse me, um, 
the, the um, curator, Beral Madra, who um, said that I would like to explore the, uh, the, the, this book. Like this is the, she kind of gave us like a kind of a initiation point. And then the book was The, uh, the Perfumed Garden by Sheikh Nasuri. And this, Sheikh Nasuri is a very, very interesting uh, like a character himself. But the book is more interesting because when it entered the um, uh, Western societies, it was translated by, um, uh, I don't want to say sir, but Richard Burton. Richard Burton who also translated the Thousand and One Nights. And translation is a, is a very interesting thing because through translation, you write a different story. So Thousand and One Nights, I, there is an encyclopedia published in, in, um, in Holland about Thousand and One Nights. And then they, in the encyclopedia, they traced every single translation in the world done to Thousand and One Nights. Because Thousand and One Nights essentially is an oral story, right? This is like a, it is not written. So there are stories that was bundled somehow. And then she, Richard uh, Burton, who's an Orientalist, uh, British called them as um, explorers, right? Um, so um, he translated um, this uh, because it, it is very interesting because it is like the book, book is like Kama Sutra of the Islamic world, right? It defines every <coughs> single, like just like hadiths, that certain hadiths, it gives you, gives men and women advices how to have a satisfactory sexual life with all the details, just like Kama Sutra. And then they said that probably he heard, uh, he read about it, uh, or he encountered the Kama Sutra thinking, and then he wanted to write something for the Arabic world, right? Which was very interesting. But when you translate it, you translate something like that, it becomes the fantasy. It fulfills the fan fantasy of the like a, a, a British uh, society. What does it do? It is the, the phantasmagoria of the Oriental, and which is very interesting. So we decided that in, when we, when we see, uh, see these things, uh, why don't we do something that is like a normally like an Eastern person don't do? So we take um, like a Western religious concept and fantasize about it. And then for confessions, I think it's one of the things that, especially when you're online, Everybody start confessing, right? You go to Facebook, everybody's confessing. I confess all the time, especially Twitter, you confess, you eat something, or that you do something bad, you confess, and then you're, you're fine. And that this the tradition of the con confession, the Catholic confession, we felt that it was so appropriate with the context, right? The Venice, obviously, it's very Catholic. So we, we decided that we should start confessing online, right? We are, he lives in Istanbul, I live in, uh, um, I live in uh, New York, and then we start emailing each other all the confessions. And then ov obviously, very quickly, it became like a total, you don't know which one is right, which one is wrong. So the confession is something like that too, because it's your fantasies. Or it is like just a, you're playing with it. It can be just a play, right? And then these, th these are some of the confessions. These were presented in this space. When Gwen said that I sometimes eat at McDonald's, I said, really? <laughs> like, I just, like, I'm not going to tell you it's right or wrong <laughs> because he may, be, he may eat at uh, McDonald's. But it's funny, like when you say that, oh, I smelled my mom's underwear, something like that. It becomes like a, it is like a. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes do, actually, I have to confess. <laughs> Anyway, so the, another vermal model that we built just to like uh, represent this kind of like uh, random associations between people. Like in a way that we, uh, we wanted to represent this idea of like uh, being somewhere but like doing something uh, other than relevant to the context that you're in. 
especially when we were doing this project between New York and Istanbul, while we were confessing, we said that let's go out and then start walking. We'd give uh, ourselves assignments, basically. And then let's start walking, and then we should take pictures by looking down. And then looking pictures looking up. And then just like we mixed the confessions, we wanted to mix the things that, photographs that we collected. And then the, you realize that you suddenly, it, it becomes very fuzzy. You, ca you cannot understand because the context, normally you look at the cars, right? You look at the plate, you understand that you are in New York City. And actually this is something that Stephen Shore uh, said that he always put a car in the picture because he wanna know <coughs> where he is and also he wanna know in which time period he is in, right? Because car is very like a definitive, like a kind of a social object. Whereas when you don't look at those things, when you look at the people, like you don't know what kind of time zone you're in. I can, I could have taken these pictures last year, like the same thing, right? Or, and also you look it up and then you see a mosque, you see a skyscraper, you see a, a church, and then you see like a telephone poles. Anyway, this was presented like this um, with, with the text. And then the projection. This is like a, I cannot show you right now, but this is constantly moving. It's kind of like f re reforming, as if like a representing this kind of idea of the, the idea of confession itself. And also we always, we again, we always uh, write a text to be distributed in the exhibition. So like a, a, instead of like a creator or a historian writes about us, we write, we try to make a statement. I still do like, I don't work as a, coll a collective anymore, but I still write uh, my text. So another project that I'm gonna, very uh, I'm gonna be very quick, somewhat related to, uh, with this, because 2001, it was a kind of a turning point for um, all of us, right? Um, because of the World Trade Center and things went downhill very quickly. I came in US 2000, it was a like very open-minded society. Everybody had this like positive attitude. Then suddenly you had the bush, like a trying to invade the world. And then this, everything was like people became like a, like a kind of fascistic. Even the close people that you know, they, they, they're angry, obvious reasons. And uh, we wanted to like a do, like a, when we were invited to the same exhibition that we, uh, this was the in Kunstmuseum. Uh, we presented the other work as well. Uh, we wanted to do a, a new project about the idea of the two, this two worlds like uh, uh, inside each other, right? Because you were glued to the screen and then you are looking something that is like a, that is moving in a certain speed, but also the, the life that you are inside, that you are experiencing and moving in a certain speed. This is the just first day. That actually, there are some pictures that was taken in the first day of uh, 2001. And then at the time, Gwen also was taking pictures in um, Istanbul, but we started like the idea of ground zero. And then in, in Istanbul, in Constantinople, there was a stone. And they, they said that that stone is the zero, right? That was the, the basically setting like a benchmark, right? That was the ground zero of the Byzantium empire. Right, because you associate something, an object, a, a kind of a monument, and then you start thinking about everything as, as a proximity uh, or um, distance from that particular thing, right? Um, so we basically, in the pictures, we recorded that with the hand GPS. Now you could, you could do this with an iPhone, but uh, we recorded all the photographs <laughs> that we took, and then each location that we took has a, had a GPS location that has was hand recorded <laughs> so, and then we kind of present it as if like a, an information an important information passing by this is a, a projection that was presented in the space as if something is like constantly an important thing passing by but nothing is do nothing is happening only two worlds inside this just moving slowly and large format photographs that was taken in Istanbul historical site which is the 
like old Byzantine sites. All right, again, like a kind of a war um, team uh, continues because uh, in 2003, this after the two years of long, um, like a um, struggle, uh, the the U.S. decided to invade Iraq. Right? It was like March 2003, I guess, and then we were in in New York protesting with all the other people, um, but nothing happened. Right? They nevertheless. Uh, American people could not stop uh, the war. And we still, I think, feel these consequences. If we could have stopped that war in 2003, war, like the world, could have been a much better uh, uh, place. Um, same thing, like in, in m uh, many aspects, because it affects the same region, right? Because I, I show this picture, because this is the, this is the area uh, called Mesopotamia. Fertile Crescent, the whole area is called Fertile Crescent, is that they call it cradle of the civilization, right? The oldest university is there, oldest city is there, the first like historical document found there, everything that is like relevant to the idea of civilization born there, so it's, it's so much importance, right? And then at the same time for Turks uh, like us or Turkish citizens, it's uh, so much importance because of the uh, because of the war between the PKK and the Turkish state consumed almost over 40,000 people and kind of polarized the society and still going on. So the war happened in, in a point, in a point that's like a, this, all these issues that we were discussing for this particular uh, landscape, right? This uh, one thing that is historical importance and then the other is contemporary political importance. But one other thing that we felt that this was so important, that it was the pre-historical, which is the Neolithic importance, right? Because the, when we talk about history, we talk about the written, documented past. And then you have to look at the documents. But as artists, we don't look at documents the way that the uh, historians do, because we look at the things around us, objects, everything. And we felt that the, the method of archaeology is more inter interesting for us than method of history, right? Looking at the actual documentation. Because the archaeologists actu actually look at things visually. And they say the field survey, they come to a place and then they look at it, right? They want to understand the landscape first before doing anything. Um, so this is a, these are Chatelurk. We, we started our journey, we set up a journey to go to the Mesopotamia, right? Just, uh, we were invited for the Istanbul Biennial, that's the backdrop of it. The, to, to, the title of the Biennial was Poetic Justice, dealing with the idea of the war in contemporary empire, whatever the stage is that we are, political stage that we are in. These are all the Neolithic settlements in the region. And the most important one is Çatalhöyük. And it is, uh, it is uh, researched by Ian Hoder, Ian Hoder, I think. It's a British archaeologist, Stanford. He works at Stanford, and he's digging this last 15 years. And they call this site is the is this uh, uh, site of the millennium, because it's the it is the it can't. Jane Jacobs writes about it. First, in 1960s, Mallard. Um, uh, an archaeologist found this place and they realized that there is no town center, right? Until then, we were thinking about that if you are living with a bunch of people, more than a kind of a size, like let's say a thousand people. And it's a natural, um, social hierarchy is natural outcome of the uh, size. So the, when you increase the size, there is a division of labor and then there's a special hierarchy. And then when you, they look at this site, there is no town center. There is no monumental building. There is no um, uh, buildings or the structures that were, can be identified as higher strata. So actually, like when they start digging uh, uh, these, let me see if I have any, uh, I don't have it, I guess, oh, here. This is the, th they found these um, 
uh, mini sculptures, and then they thought that this was the site for the like uh, this uh, matriarchal society, right? They really thought that like, and still there are lots of archaeologists argue that this is the. There was a moment then in history that like Amazon this uh, myth, right? And there was a moment that was a matriarch, uh, the possibility of a matriarchal society, which is egalitarian. I mean, we may be projecting our own intentions, but nevertheless, you look at the site, you don't see those things that you would see in a Greek city or um, the cities that you would see in Mesopotamia, right? And then when you look at these sites, you don't see monuments. You see earth. But they are digging. I mean, they are digging like seriously. They do x-rays. Ob obviously, they may uh, find it because the way that they, they do archaeology today is so different than, I'm going to come to archaeology again, but uh, keep in mind that they are doing this archaeology is a very, very methodo um, methodo methodological way, right? So, so they, they uncover layer by layer. And then they, what they find is, um, is like lit little pieces of things, not like structures and like uh, sculptors or like the nice buildings, and they are uncovering basically earth. So that's kind of a beautiful metaphor, right? You're looking to a landscape, and you're looking to most important archaeological sites in recent history, and you're seeing nothing but earth, right? So and then what? For me, as a photographer. Now that I'm like looking as a photographer, I'm seeing something, I'm seeing nothing, but I'm seeing everything. And I'm seeing, they're seeing, they're uncovering, they're cataloging all these like little findings that they have. But there is another forms of archaeology, right? More recent. And when they, what they find is that they find some, like when do they do, this is not me. <laughs> But um, I found this picture on Google, obviously, and that these are amphoras, right? Amphoras are used to um, transfer goods from one place to another. They are not beautiful objects. And I, I think we were discussing this, right, um, in the class, like, because the idea of the museum suddenly in the 18th, 19th century, you take some, you go to the east, you take people's daily objects, and you present them as art. And then you think that, oh, they are so beautiful. Like, but no, they are used objects, right? And then these objects are basically containers, containers of sorts. And then when you look at the inside of those containers, you understand that, let's say, you find a specific amphora, and you understand that it's built in Athens, in an amphora shop, because they understand. The archaeologist has methods that they visually look at it, and then they, with the material technique, the form say that this is made in Athens. And, but they find it in Egypt. And then they start to develop a narrative, right? This is how archaeology, the archaeologists work. They develop a narrative. And they develop, this narrative includes the information that is, uh, uh, Ian Hodder calls this post possessual right? The information that we are uncovering from the past includes today, right? Because this is not just we are uncovering the past and we are like telling the truth. No, he says that we are uncovering the past now. We are telling a story now. We are looking around us now. So that's beautiful again. So what we did is to set up a um, mission, basically, to uh, go all the way, to make, like, we kind of like identify only in Turkey, not Iraq or uh, Syria, unfortunately, because we could not even go to Iraq. Um, in Turkey, in the Kurdish zone, which is the war zone in itself, uh, we identify all the Neolithic settlements and also the historic like, importance settlements that was left over by the other civilizations. Right? We, wanna, we, wanna do, we wanted to do a visual survey of the past in present. And so basically, we start our tour. Uh, this is Chatalurik. So when you go to the site in Chatalurik, you see nothing. I mean, you see a mound. And then this mound is built because they built over a thousand years. 
and 10,000 people lived in it at one point. And then they lived, and when they f uh, f uh, people died, they buried the dead people inside the room, and they built over, and then they go up, up, up with their dead. And then so like in the very like a um, flat landscape, a mound build up. A mound that is like <coughs> a hard drive, like kind of like it's a data source, right? When you look at it, you see a thumb drive, basically, <laughs> but in Earth. So we start, these are large format photographs again. Like we start going and then camping and waking up in the morning like a traditional photographer, but we are like conceptual photographers, so we are different than Ansel Adams, and also he is much better than us. So <laughs> anyway, so these are like, a, these are all archeological sites. And then the archeological sites sits in the places that is, uh, has contemporary uh, political relevance for the people that who are looking at. So when you say this picture is from one, then in Turkey, it means something. Like each photograph obviously had the uh, captions. And like now the idea of the containment contained. So the, 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 this, uh, the trip started that we wanted to do a contemporary archeological survey. So this survey included the obviously older archeological sites, but we wanted to um, do a contemporary survey of a contemporary condition of the contemporary people. And what would you find if you look at the Kurdistan Iraq border? Because when you look at this, um, amphoras, you find like a broken amphoras that was used to carry oil or grain and things like that. So what would I, w w and then this was precisely the idea was to look at the uh, trade between Iraq and Turkey. After 1991, 91, right, the first Gulf War. So there was, um, when they made it, they said that you cannot, uh, they, to they told Iraq that you, they cannot uh, export more than $2 billion of oil. And that was had to be done through the um, control of the UN. But in order to bypass that trade, Turkish truck drivers would go to Iraq and then would carry the uh, gas back, claim that it was their own. In order to do that, they modify their trucks Basically, they lift everything up. They have this top container, but they, they make that part smaller. So they built these structures to fit underneath their trucks. And then they were passing the border. Oh, it's my gas. Personal use, four tons, <laughs> right? And they're, they're like, in, when you are traveling like thousands of kilometers, you see thousands of containers like that. They were discarded because the government said that because of the UN pressures. You cannot bring more than 500 liter gas to, from Iraq to Turkey. So these containers were discarded. And we said that this is the contemporary, this is the object, this is the container. But this is the container that sits in the containment zone, right? That's why we call it the containment contain, because the containment, the metaphor works in multiple ways, right? Containment because of the region is the Kurdistan, and then this because of the war there is the high alert, like a kind of a martial law. In 2000, I the, before this project started, the project started because I went in to Jizre to Iraq border in Turkey in 2000 as a kind of a personal trip just to see the region, and in Jizre, police, I was taking some pic pictures, a police car came. They stopped me, they put me to the wall, they searched me, they said, who the fuck are you? I said, I'm just like, I was a researcher, uh, I had a card researcher, says, I'm a researcher. And uh, what the fuck you are doing here? I'm just taking pictures, I'm, a, I'm touristic pictures. He said that uh, you should just fuck off, we haven't seen you, you haven't seen us. And then I, I was so afraid afterwards because I realized that this wasn't a joke. There were like hundreds of, like thousands of people disappeared. There are like acid wells. People like they put people in acid wells, right? This is this, and st still these stories 
There are mass graves by the Turkish fascists, basically the police. This, this area it was, a, was no joke, right? These people gone through this war and still going through this war, and, uh, and they are in the containment area. And the, the idea of the containment works in multiple ways. In, let's say, in Palestine, the containment, how, it, how does it work? Checkpoint, right? You built a wall, and then you say that you, when you're entering through the checkpoint, we check your ID, we harass you. So this way, state imposes its own idea, its own power on you, on your body, both mentally and physically. But in this case, the, the land is huge, like four or five times, ten times of Israel, right? They, no wall can be built. So what they do is to, every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you have a checkpoint. I was like Shurnak to um, Batman, 90 kilometers, 60 miles. I could travel in four hours, five hours. Empty road because of the checkpoints. I, they were taking my phone. They were taking the battery. They were writing the um, serial number of the phone and the battery to their database. And next checkpoint, they were checking those too to see that if you are ch exchanging the cell phone batteries with the guerrilla groups. Because the guerrilla, obviously, they cannot charge. At the time, they, don't, they didn't have the solar-powered <laughs> chargers, probably. So they were exchanging the batteries when you're driving. So they are checking the IDs. That kind of, like, I'm talking about, that kind of, like, level of control that imposed to people. So this containment become like the idea of containment. Of course, when there's a containment, there is a check valve, or there's a valve, there's an entry point, output, etc. So, so that was the idea. And then we selected one object to be brought to the exhibition space as an archaeological uh, example. Basically, like we we said that okay, this is the this is the container that represents all the other containers. And also, it represents the idea of the containment itself. So the wall, you cannot see it right now. Maybe you can see it a little bit here. It says there is white on white text, just like earth on earth. Like the information is embedded to the earth. And Juven's um, uh, art history professor came, Jale Erzan. She's like very famous. She wrote a lot of books. And then she said that, Juven, you you should not do this. It's not a good practice. Nobody can read this. And this is the precise of the point. You go to the region, these fucking Turks go to the southeast of Turkey. They look at it. They don't see anything. You see nothing when you go to this place because you have to read it. You have to read all these stories that is like built on top of each other, right? How you are going to uncover it? It has to be a delicate process, right? You cannot just come with your like dozers and then, oh, I'm doing archaeology. It is not like that. And we felt that the as a discipline, archaeology worked in a, in a way that's much better like a, to understanding these layers and as a visual input, right? Of course, I'm talking about this like a, almost half an hour. When you go to the exhibition, you say, what the fuck is that? <laughs> no, we write that there's a brochure with all the things that we were saying. People could take it because that's, it's important. It's a, it was a political statement. So it, was like, it wasn't just like a, a bunch of pictures and a bunch of text on the wall. We wanted to tell this story just the way that an archaeologist would tell. I mean, as a political story, as a story of our uh, time now. So um, then slight shift in 2005. Uh, maybe I should, uh, I'm not going to show the old video, but um, obviously the Turkey, like, I mean, as a photographer, you always go to places um, uh, and take pictures. I mean, you go and then urban city is the place that you always do. Like you walk around, you try to, just like you go to a landscape, you go to a cityscape and you look at it. Um, Maybe I should just, but before you, you want to ask any question? Sorry, I, maybe I'm going too fast because I'm looking to the time. I don't want to be. Okay, this is like a, the sound, you get it because it's just a uh, atmospheric sound. I'm just gonna. 
close that. Um, so the, we were thinking about, of course, the, the transformation of the city. When you think about the, the idea of the city, then you think about the transformation of the city, like New York, New York City's case, right? You look at, like, um, from uh, Manhattan to Brooklyn, you see all these high rises. And what does, it, what does that mean? What, it means accumulation of the, uh, of the capital in certain way. That's the representation of it. And uh, when you look at to downtown, you look at, you see a different story. You can start right at, like you can start talking about the Goldman Sachs, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we do that. For Turkey, between 2001, because the financial crisis happened in Turkey in 2001, not 2008, the banking system collapsed and government took over all the banks and complete neoliberal transformation started through the uh, imposition of the IMF and World Bank. Right? That is the usual story of the, all the emerging markets. Right? You have a crisis and then the IMF and World Bank give you a recipe. And then you implement that recipe and then you are saved. Not quite because we know that last summer uh, we uprised because of this, actually. We started with looking at this. Uh, uh, this is the, um, the basic the vid videos that you are looking is the vid like a financial district. From four sides, two minutes videos that we basically like a set in the map the, and then we pla place the locations and we want to look at this financial district in four different angles because we knew that that is the thing that is happening. That is, and then the idea of the siege, obviously, it's very interesting, right? Um, I'm not going to show much, but we, the siege um, of Istanbul is about siege of Istanbul by the Ottomans, <coughs> right? The Con Constantinople becomes Istanbul, right? The siege lasted like uh, how many days? Like 37 days or something like that. And um, there's lots of stories about it, but Ottomans killed a bunch of people and et cetera, et cetera. So they took over the Istanbul. But at the time, there were city walls. And then you, as an invader, come through the city wall. And these city walls, like, want to defend you. Or they collapse and you are invaded. Today, what does the contemporary siege? Like, that was the question. And then we thought that this contemporary siege is not about, like, a country invading another country. That's not going to happen. Contemporary siege is, like David Harvey says, contemporary siege is coming like a tsunami through the financial markets, right? It comes with the huge capital influx from inside, right? Just like a, like a sewage is coming up. And then, and then when it goes away, it leaves a devastation and disgusting smell. And this is what happens everywhere in the world. It comes with the very forceful, it comes in and then it leaves a, with the devastation behind. So that was the that was the idea, and then we took the uh, videos and um, and pictures. Let me see. Oh, I don't have the pictures there. Sorry. Pictures of the um, the uh, old city walls, like what's happening there, because old city walls became just like a lot of stories, like like Detroit, in a way that at one point those places that were really high, then then they collapsed. And people start doing urban farming. It, bec it becomes like a garbage collecting area, recycle area. People are, like, if you go to the website, you can see the uh, videos. But people are um, raising horses. They are raising sheep in the middle of Istanbul, right? So they are using these spaces that's leftover space in between the wall and the, like, a road. So these are four by five slides that we took. And these slides are presented in the, in a, uh, like a, in a screen that was projected on. So you're looking at light box. Light box is created by the projector. So like that was a kind of a dilemma, right? You're looking something, you have to look something both very close in order to see this amazing detail of the four by five, but also <coughs> in order to see the big picture, which is the text that like telling the story, you have to go outside and then you don't see anything again. So like, uh, I think this like, idea of seeing, getting close to something and then uh, being away is always like uh, interest me. Like you always want to see something that's like so close, but also, also you don't see anything when you are so close. And then there's a website component for it that has uh, pictures, etc. 
it's like the, actually when we did projects as Exurban, we always we always had a web component that's different than just the presentation. Questions? <laughs> You're quiet. Mm -hmm. So um, I've noticed that you um, you have this way of, of taking these these very political, very compelling um, stories and um, stories is the right word, but um, and then kind of packaging them into um, this gallery ready yes. um, presentation, and I was wondering if that is at all a complicated transition or transformation for you if like, you know, your tendency to be an activist and then also a gallery artist is at all in conflict, or if, or if you've found like a harmonious way to connect those two. I think, uh, again, it's a great question, and it's also like a very provocative question. I, I see the provocation, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, no, no, it's good because, uh, uh, yes, I totally agree with you that I use the gallery space. And I think that I kind of like the white cube or the black cube, like, because I feel like it's a white page. That's a temporary opportunity that it was giving to art. It's a temporary zone. But also, like we discussed this in the class, this temporary zone is nothing that is like, a, oh, it's a, it's a utopic space, right? It in incorporates all the bullshit that any institution that we, like this, right? Everything that is like, a, or the, the university that I'm teaching, like that r relate to that. But also we use this space, now we are using it, now I'm talking, so it's like I'm filling this space. This like stupid cinema-like room, I'm using that for something that is like, Maybe interesting, maybe not. But also, at, this, at the same time, this prov uh, provides me an opportunity to establish a dialogue. And, and also, I'm not a gallery artist. I don't, I'm not represented by a gallery, but I'm not against gal gallery system. Same thing. Like, I feel like artists are prostitutes. They have to sell themselves to survive. And it's an honorable job to be a prostitute. <laughs> it's not honorable to buy it. It is like a, the reverse is the problem. Right? It is not honorable to pay for the prostitute. It's honorable to be prostitute. That's the dilemma. But don't you want to get paid if you're a prostitute? Yes, of course. I will. I'm a sex worker. I'm. I'm. I'm get paid. <laughs> but uh, I, when that that person pays me, that person has the uh, political oh, yeah. ethical dilemma and all these uh, ethical questions there on their shoulder, not mine. Because of the social <laughs> wealth. <laughs> No, no, I'm not scared. This is the, the you are saying that the person that who's uh, selling their services f to feed their kids is morally lower. That is a bourgeois. You see what I mean? We have to reverse that thing, the bourgeois thinking, because the bourgeois is the one that's who's dirty, not the workers. <laughs> so when you are from Turkey, obviously you cannot escape archaeology, right? You. You hit archaeology all the time, because like when you came to the U.S., everybody's like, like my partner is here. She she thinks that our uh, 90 years old apartment is an piece of archaeology, mm -hmm. whereas like we start talking about archaeology uh, when it is older than 500 years old, older than the U.S. history, right? Anyway, so uh, I, that's why I'm very much interested in like looking at those sites. Not that I'm like knowledgeable. I don't know the Greek history much. Etc. But I look at those sites that I go there and then I look at it because it's, a, it's like just like a museum, right? You have this opportunity to like see something that is not there. Like it's you imagine. Normally, when you look at the, an archaeological site, you usually see uh, ruins, and then they like that's the actual site, and then these are the reconstruction. So you imagine a reconstruction. So this is the site in Bergaman. Pergamon, Bergama we call it in Turkey, and um, it is one of the most amazing um, uh, examples of the Greek uh, sculpture. They call maybe it's the one of the top. Is the Zeus Temple? Is the Zeus Temple is built uh, to commemorate the war between the giants and the Olympian gods, and obviously Olympian gods won the war, and then they built this to commemorate that, and Germans took it. 
This is in Berlin, right? Pergo in Pergamon Museum. So it's very good and very interesting because they built the Pergamon Museum when they were building the reimagining the city of Berlin. They uh, built the city um, based on like a looking like they built the museum and then city uh, opens up from it because they thought that at the time they thought that the the, the most beautiful examples, like the idea of the Germanness comes from the Greek. And this was the most amazing example of it to start the idea of this like uh, nation building process. So, um, but the, 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 the thing is they stole this. I mean, they had like the shady agreements, etc. but like basically they stole it. And they took piece by piece and reconstructed. And what is left behind, this is a picture, and this is just the, I mean, ruins, but ruins, normally ruins are full, right? When you go to an archaeological site, if it's not stolen or like uh, by the th uh, thieves, although it is not reconstructed, but it is, it inherits, inherits the possibility of that knowledge. But when you take something from it, then something is missing that you don't understand, that it's missing. What was missing here? That you don't, you can never imagine it because this is not there anymore. See what I mean? There is something, and this is true for any kind of, and uh, this uh, project, I did this 2005, later on, um, uh, Jalal Tufik and um, uh, Jalal Tufik wrote more, but um, uh, Walid Rad also mentioned this when they were looking to uh, Beirut. Not the same way. They don't say it's void, but they don't say. They are similarly, they are looking to Beirut. They are seeing buildings that are not there. They are looking at the void, but nobody can appreciate that void because it's not there anymore. It's overbuilt by something else. Basically, went to, um, this is the top one, is the, um, the site itself. And then the second one, I'm going to show you, I think I should show you this first. The second thing, just one, um, I should be quick, um, I think one or two miles outside this site, there's Pergamon gold mine. And they were like, it was one of the most controversial gold mining processes, like uh, because they wanted to use cyanide leaching process. And cyanide leaching is, as you know, cyanide is one very poisonous. Basically, when you extract the gold from earth, you leave a poisonous remains. So we felt that this idea of the archaeology, which is stealing, and the idea of the extracting something from earth and leaving the remains of the earth behind and killing everything through the process, it's very similar. Because you extract, because very different than Chataloyuk, right? When you look at the Chataloyuk pictures, they are uncovering the bones and grains and like earth. Like they are not monumental. They are, because they are, you're uncovering a knowledge. Whereas like German, they are not interested in knowledge. They are interested in the monument. So monument contradicts the non-monument, right? Monument is overriding the mon non-monument. Non-monument is the voices of the people that was embedded to the earth. By, in order to reach that monumental, you are destroying all the possible knowledge that could be accumulated. Because uh, the, the archaeology that was done until the late 70s, 80s was precisely that. They were coming in to an archaeological site. They were doing a trench. They call it like survey trench. So they, built, they took like a, a 6 uh, to 10 meter to like 10 meter deep, they dig it. And then they are just like destroying whatever, and then they are looking to the layers. And in Troy, it happened that way, right? It, there were 11 civilizations. And they realized, shit, what did we do? We just destroyed everything, <laughs> right? Because they were like, they, because they wanted to read something, right? The gold or the sculpture, the whatever they, they want to find, but they could not find anything. They are just finding the civilization after civilization because they wanted to find this Troy treasures, right? And they find it afterwards. But at what cost, right? 
So for us, that was a that was a dilemma. If you want to survive, if you want to do something in life, you have to destroy. You have to you have to make changes on earth, and this is an ethical consequences to it. And as an artist, you cannot just say that oh, stop demolishing anything. No, you don't. I don't say that because I'm using film or all the chemical processes at the time, right? You are actually destroying something. So uh, being ethical means that you justify what you do. So in those cases, you cannot justify what you do. But we said that okay, we want to justify these kind of displacements. We want to take the. We want to do things because um, when you displace something, you can only see the displacement while you are displacing it. Robert Smithson did some projects that I found out later on. He did some photographs, overturned rocks. It's a beautiful series, actually, not, not like that famous, but I find it very interesting for my work because we went to the archaeological site. We got a paperwork saying that we want to photograph. We want to do a video in the archaeological site. We had the permission. But we went there illegally. I, we are harming and we are displacing archaeological objects. So basically, what we did is to per, is, this is a performance. Yeah, these are like the top two videos, like bottom two videos that you are seeing. Is that performance done in the Pergamon site, ar actual archaeological site? We are displacing and destroying, and also I'm destroying the plants because. We thought that the idea of destruction, who owns the land? What are we like harming when we do this kind of destruction? Who has the right to the land? And then if we just say that, oh, Turks has the right, or local people have the right, or the municipality has the right, then you are thinking anthropomorphically, and which is also a problem, right? We have to think about the right of the plant. And like by destroying the plant, then I'm making that visible and also taking the ethical responsibility. So these are all like a, like a basically pieces of. We, did we didn't want to destroy anything or move anything serious. But these are all archaeological like a, the objects that you should never ever touch it. And on top two videos, and you see the gold mine is operating. There is no, it is also, this emptiness isn't down there. You don't see that. So like basically there is a dig, there's a hole, and they're digging it. As you know that story. And then they're like taking it to the factory. They are processing it and then dumping it there. And then these uh, texts on the videos are the names of the flowers, local flowers. Local language. I have another project that relates to flowers because I, although like a f as a photographer, when you see a flower, not if you, if not Robert, Robert Mapplethorpe, you see that like okay, okay like it's just started photography, right? Like, I, but I, actually photographs like I start thinking the photographs are the most political thing that you can do in a landscape like this, because they are the one that who get destroyed first. And if you want to think about uh, rights, then you have to think about the top layer of this archaeological site that was protecting that site. Maybe thousands of years. They were like dying and rebuilding, and this is like beautiful layer, like a blanket covering the landscape. Then you are ignoring it. Anyway, so on top of it, we wanted to rem uh, like bring earth to the gallery, 10 tons of earth. And then we agreed with the uh, villagers, and then we hired a truck and excavator. <coughs> so we said that if there is 30 gram of gold in one ton of earth, that means that if we get 10 ton of earth, we will have 300 gram of gold, and we would like to display that gold in the in the window because normally you display the gold in the window, right? And then we displayed it. We dumped. Uh, we brought this. Of course, like this. This was crazy because you, when you bring 10 tons of um, earth from that side, the second day, the whole gallery was infested with bugs. They were like, oh my god, let's go free. Like, <laughs> we came to the big city. <laughs> 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 so.
So th that's like displayed on the wall, and also the, the name of the flowers again, like, uh, like this. And then you see the earth, and then you see the pictures, and wall text, and the, these are large format, six by 17, like we had this like back, and then the, like very detail of the pictures that you look at, like minute detail of earth, basically. It doesn't do justice when you look at the projector, but it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I think this is one of the most beautiful thing that I did, like as a beautiful thing that I would like maybe want to put in my wall one day. If I have that much of a wall, we don't have that wall. So, <laughs> so <laughs> no, no problem for now. But there are like some views from the Acropolis from looking outside because this site is amazing. Like when you look, sit, and also it refers to this <laughs> voidness of it. So another, like, uh, that's why I put these projects to kind of bundle some projects together because there are in between there are some random projects that we did or I did. And uh, I'm, I want to show something that I'm currently also like interested in. Maybe I'll get your feedback and maybe in 20 minutes I'll finish it so that it's not too late. And this botanic carcinoma, um, the, in 2005 or six, there are a bunch of like Armenian and Turkish artists um, got together and start talking. And then there were some curators, there were scholars, and then we start like a meeting, and then this kind of organized meetings turned into a kind of an exhibition project created by Daphne Ayash and Niri Malkomian. So what they did is to like a kind of initiate the, like how can we approach the idea of the Armenian genocide? Because Armenian genocide in Turkey, you cannot talk about it. Like maybe you know Orhan Pamuk, who's the Nobel Prize winner, Turkish, like a writer who mentioned about the Armenian genocide and there were um, like a many, many court cases against him. And then they threatened him to put him to the jail, right? There is like, it's not a joke. And then there was an, uh, in 2009, there was a, I think it's 2009. Now it's time passed, 2008 maybe. Uh, an Armenian uh, jur uh, journalist, Turkish Armenian journalist was killed by the Turkish thugs, basically, nationalist thugs. So the issue of Armenian genocide, you cannot talk about it openly. Maybe things are changing now, and we can talk about it, but before, especially before, you could not because the official language. But nevertheless, the, the obviously, if you don't call it genocide, the massacre, the great catastrophe, there are lots of different terms that they are associated because genocide is a term, is a very problematic term. Not problematic that I'm, I don't see that I could use it, but like a historian says that genocide is a term coined because of the genocide happened after the Second World War, right? right? Like, and then they, they officially recognize the genocide as the genocide. Whereas there are other uh, uh, scholars says that no, actually the first time that they used the genocide, actually they show, they prove that after the Armenian genocide. No matter what, there were millions, over a million, maybe a million and a half, Armenian were killed, maybe less, I don't know the no actual number, or um, uh, deported uh, from the land that they had. So these are some of the, some of the pictures that you could uh, find online, right? Demolished homes. And I was looking at all these pictures when I, we were trying to do this project. And then you look at, like, you look at the picture and then you see Okay, you, of course you see this refugee camp and you see the human drama. But you don't know that when you look at these pictures, especially at the time, these are villagers, right? And then it's 1915. So 1915, these records and all these things were destroyed. So th this document, the idea of document, again, the historic, historical record does not exist in many cases. But we talk, when we talk about genocide, we kind of make an umbrella generalization and ignore the, the life or livelihood of the people, real people, the real testimonies, right? When you generalize something, you just ignore, you kind of like, uh, I mean, statistically, you make an average, and then that eliminates the stories. And there are lots of like new, very smart, like oral historians, right? They are trying to write those stories through the objects and remains or records 
like some sort of like um, second hand or third hand witnesses, they are trying to uncover these in different methods, right? Especially after the feminist uh, scholars, because they really thought that the um, the idea of the oral history is much more important for feminist scholars, because it was the man's history, right? And also, the, when, when we talk about the um, uh, genocide, the, then you, ca you cannot eliminate, you cannot hold yourself back not to talk about the idea of the modern Turkish state and the, the idea of the monument in modern Turkish state, right? So f these are the things that I was thinking. Like a t and I'm still thinking about it because it's 2015 is the 100 year, 100 year anniversary of the genocide. And it's going to be an important moment, I think, in Turkish history to face that in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, so what I did, uh, what we did basically to, again, we wanted to go to the sites that were like a, the, uh, in the past were uh, Armenian sites. This is a video, please, actually. Anyway, you look at these sites that you start seeing, again, not much. I mean, this is not a, there's no like a home or anything, but we felt that the real witnesses of the, these are the Armenian villages. We visited like 10 to 20 Armenian villages, and we want, some of them were kind of occupied by the newcomers, and some of them were destroyed totally. So you, do, you just, and they're not monumental at all, they are just like chataluk in a way, and then you see just plants.
All right, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to pass that. So um, during the trip, we collected a sample, rock sample from a village, just to, again, a kind of a representative uh, um, archaeological object or like geological object even because it wasn't even like a meaningfully like a carved or anything. It's just a piece of uh, uh, home. And then they, we collected some uh, um, flowers. So the idea of the flower, like again, uh, came again because of the uh, all the people that who visited, uh, uh, I think Tourneau Four, like a French uh, botanist, visited the whole region in late 1700s, I think beginning of the 1800s, to come to northern Anatolia, uh, northeast of Anatolia, to collect all these samples. So we thought the idea of the uh, naming process was very interesting, right? Because when you name something, you have to name based on the based on the, the genesis of the plant, and you, they use this like a very structured way of like uh, naming plants, and usually like naming plants refer to the place that they were found, like city of Artvin. They found a flower there. They put a Latin name of Artvin, and then they Latinized the whole thing, and then they named it. It's kind of like, but at the same time, th all these plants had local names, right? So the idea of this categorization and na uh, naming, Barbara Kruger also writes about this. It's very, very forceful, right? Because the idea of the modern state actually um, functioned that way when they were categorizing the Armenian people. They were, before that, people were living there. Obviously, they were speaking different language, but they don't m perhaps even need to identify themselves as Armenian, right? You just live somewhere, and suddenly somebody come to you, you're Armenian, because you speak Armenian, but there are tons of different Armenian dialects, or Kurdish dialects, or Turkish dialects. And suddenly you are categorized under the umbrella of Armenians, and then state decides that Ottoman state should be the Turkish state or the Muslim state. Then you start uh, erasing all these things. So this, I think the idea of the modernization was very interesting. So what we did is to collect uh, flowers to try and kind of bring the justice. We kind of uh, renamed everything. Remedy artificium, like artificial remedy. Like all the flowers has its own... Um, Repressor alienate. So, like all this, like we we um, we collected all these flowers. I think we collected thirty of them. We used twelve of them, but and uh, like that's what that's what you. Um, so it was the this plant was collected to, from these uh, villages themselves as a kind of a silent testament, witnesses. So, but I'll. Uh, maybe I'll I'll show this to you as well because it may be relevant to the um, Siegecraft project. So this uh, one, this vi this is a video, and you're seeing a video now. So don't be fooled that it's not nothing is moving because it was um, we took this video the day that was the Israel was invading Gaza or bombing Gaza, and then we went to the Ottoman palace in Istanbul. We directed our camera and um, towards Gaza, and in between, we said that this is the we want to write the story of whatever we could see. And it was a rainy day, and it was a very uh, misty day. So this is like a video, like almost ten minutes, but we took like a thirty minutes of video. And like sometimes, like there is some birds passing, and in the in the behind there is a there's a boat. But we, we then we see um, the Marmara Sea, right? This is the Sea of Marmara, which brought the the which possibly will bring again the the earthquake that Istanbul is expecting. So the idea of sea start to very interest us. Like, what does it mean to look at sea? And what does it mean that we are looking at a particular point of view, right? Because like when you you are saying that I'm looking to Gaza right now, but I'm seeing all these things in between. 
what does it mean? And sea is itself is like a, in mythology and everything that has a lot of connotations, right? Sea was something that was, had always brought um, monstrosity. Although it's beautiful, but it's, you always expect that something will really bad come to you. But it will come to you from the sea. So this was the initiation of the project in a way that uh, we look at the sea and then we start thinking about it. Um, a lot of historians wrote about sea and of course a lot of artists, right? The um, uh, British um, painters, like uh, I forgot his name now. Sorry, yeah. Like beautiful, a lot of a lot of examples that seascape was something that is also the, when they look at it at the time, the British explorers, they, it represented something that is more than the monstrosity. It now after the 17th, 16th century, maybe it represented opportunity, right? The, like suddenly looking at sea is no longer is looking at sea, encountering other things, but looking at sea means that you are looking. Like as an artist, you're looking to see that representing the nation. You're representing, like we are, when you are like a painting those like ships, the, the struggle, the seamanship, and all these things that you say something about it. And then we, um, um, we start taking a lot of, a lot of uh, photographs. Like there are 6,000 photographs here. Oh, so 4,000 photographs. And then there's all the photographs was taken next to the sea. Like the sea, but not just seeing the sea, but also sky, the earth, anything that was related with sea, and that, that was presented on pedestals. People can actually look at it. And um, where, where was it? I think in, in Athens, they, people collected it. Like people take it, and then we had to print it again. Um, so there were like a projections on the uh, two proje video projections. And then the, the rest was presented on the, like a pedestal as a uh, project. And then the video, it's more like, this is more. Um, yeah, I, uh, this can run and I'll, I'll talk quickly. This project become like bigger a little bit because we were invited to Marseille to do a residency. And then when I went there, I realized that like it was like a somewhat, when you look at these like port cities, you always find these similarities because of the global trade, right? You see the containers, you see the like uh, this uh, winches and all these things that like kind of p imposes itself to the historical side of Marseille, let's say old port, old Istanbul port. You just like, just outside of it, you built this container, graveyard or like something like that. You, this huge, massive scale um, um, uh, urban transformation starts. And then this was like a kind of a related with Siegecraft because we were really thinking about like how the neoliberalism works, how the global trade works, right? Global trade was not just like simply the capital flux, right? Capital always related with the manufacturing or the production. And then those produ produced things had to be moved in. And when they move, they have these physical um, uh, representations of those things. Like uh, Ellen Shaikula had this like, amazing um, uh, project, right? Fish story, actually. She, he um, gets into the sh ship, and then he travels with them to experience that. We, uh, like, different than that, we really want to look at Istanbul, Athens, New York, Marseille, all these like uh, port cities, how these things work. And how, again, like it's, when you look at it, you don't know where it is taken from, right? Because sea becomes like this kind, kind of homogenizer, kind of the plain field. And Keller Easterling talks about this, like uh, the globalization, the idea of globalization works only with the idea of the, the uh, stratification of the sea itself. Right, you built, you you establish this grid system, and then you start thinking about like how much, how many ships are there, like, and how many ships are moving, and there are lots of like uh, economists actually look at the ship moving data as opposed to because the ship moving means that actual production and consumption happening. So, 
uh, uh, th those economists look at the uh, Google Maps of the ships parked. If the number of the ship parked ship increases, they understand that it may the global economy may be going down, right? So looking actually like the, to do the, all these like uh, let's see the one before I pass again. Yeah, these are parked ships just waiting their their turn to be called and. Anyway, this goes or goes and goes like there are other videos too. Um, so, uh, but when you are in the city itself, you start seeing like, um, I mean, the neoliberal transformation, gentrification, all these things that we talk about all the time. But what are the visual uh, manifestation of those transformations? And this was like, a, I, don't, I don't have the um, uh, larger picture of that, but I, when I was walking in Marseille, I see the um, I see a graffiti on one of the this transformation this condo projects, right? Because they always have these um, uh, architectural renderings, right? Because they are imagining a city, imagining a urban development, imagining a building. When they are imagining it, they put some people in it. Those people usually are like in Marseille, 30, 40 percent of the population is Arab, right? They are just moving from Algeria, Tunisia, they are moving, this is the port city. Downtown of Marseille is basically Arab because the older white people moved outside. Now, the typical gentrification story, they want to uh, develop the downtown and they are imagining a city these are the details of the billboard, like the billboards that they are putting. There's no fucking single Arab person in there. They're all white, cute people that, and then this graffiti says that La Ville Blanc. Like it says like La Ville Blanc. La Ville Blanc, actually it should have been, La Ville Blanc is the white city. But La Ville Blanc is a wrong way of saying it. La Ville Blanc, it has to be, it, it should have been Blanche. Because the La Ville is the female, Blanche, it has to be Blanche. But we thought that this is a fucking beautiful mistake. I think it's not even a mistake. It's, a, it's an intentional gesture. Because this whole neoliberal idea of um, transformation, it is a patrimonial thing. It is a top to bottom thing, right? It is a male thing. So this person is writing this La Ville Blanche. And then we later said that because of the, like, a, a, like all the other places in Berlin, this gentrification, the, the Weisherstadt. Like I, I'm, I don't know German, but um, anyway, so you make this mistake that you could not make that mistake in Turkish or in English. And it was a like beautiful critique in a way by itself, right? So this, like, a, like we put the uh, pictures, um, like that was the name of the project basically at the end. Because the idea of the, like the, the, the transformation is done, although like all the narrative about this urban planning ar architectural bullshit, they are always top to bottom, very forceful. And they never ever ever learn all the discourses that we are developing in scholars and all these books and text. They are just bullshit. They are just like, st uh, the architects come, they talk about it, they talk about like beautifully, they, they show their renderings, but they, what they do with those, these people is to really transform really top to bottom. And this is actually the Gezi Istanbul, in Istanbul, what happened is precisely that, right? You come with an architecture, like a model, you imagine a space that has nothing to do with the people's needs. And then people, of course, like resisting it, resisting um, and the, the way that the, um, whatever the means that they can. But in, the, in this case, in Marseille, if you are like immigrant, then you, your possibility of resistance is not, it may not be as strong as if you're a citizen. Uh, do, have you seen the war photographer? Mm -hmm. He says something about that I felt that very like closely associated with. I'm not that hardcore, but I feel like when I, when I, um, uh, and this project too, and this is a video by the way, that, oh. 
So when I feel, when I'm, um, when I'm in the places, when I'm thinking the issues, I feel better than I'm like in front of my computer. Or when I'm doing something, actually, it's something that is there, this sadness, there is a peace in it that I'm doing it. I'm normally a happy person. I'm not, I'm not that serious. My, my art is serious. So I feel like a lot of, I met a lot of German artists. Like I'm going to make stupid generalization now, but let's say Scandinavian artists, they're like fucking serious all the time, and their work is like stupid silly. Like it can happen. This is good. I mean, this kind of transformation happens. Like, like I feel like my, I'm, I, I am not like that. I am not normally, like I take things relatively easier until Gezi, after uh, Gezi changed everything. <laughs> but, but, but I feel like uh, this kind of things makes me, uh, I feel like I'm becoming a better person. I, th I think about that a lot because I work as an editor and I work as a TV in a TV studio. I did lots of projects and there's a way of editing that um, as a photographer I despised because I felt that like the, and also the, a lot of filmmakers think about this, right? The, uh, the new reality, the, uh, new reality, do you call it, right? Uh, new, new, new realism, right, sorry. Um, the, the image is becoming something by itself without, like, you wait, you have to wait an image to, um, to be itself. How long should we wait for it? Like, I think, I, I feel like it's a totally legitimate to make a film, but I don't think that I'm making film with these. Like, that's why I like to use those as long as possible. Like, this is a four-minute video. She's just sitting, she lost her, her son, Turkish, military planes bombed the village and then they died and this is she is waiting then suddenly like for me this is a moment that i can like uh, it is it's beyond the uh, montage beyond the beyond the editing but i'm not against the editing i like uh, like uh, if there's a good movie but i'm not a filmmaker so i don't think that way i think I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, like, I cannot even say, like, probably all the archaeologists has different reasons, but the reason that I'm, like, thinking about it, because you can imagine something that cannot be proven wrong, right? Because all the, like, a myth mythology, like, if you, you find something and then you start thinking about it, and actually it, pos it creates a possibility of moving outside of the current paradigm. Like, you can actually start thinking, you can argue that there was a moment that there was a matriarchal society. And there was a moment that this society did not have the special hierarchy. You can start arguing that, oh, these people actually were egalitarian and they shared everything. They were really happy. They didn't even fight. They were having orgies and smoking pot. Like, you can start thinking about it, right? And then this is, but this is a, this is not about that moment, this is about us imagining for a future. That's why, at least for me, it's good like that. I think, like, I feel like all these, like, trips, it's a certain, there is a certain performativity to it. But the performativity, normally when you do performance, you have some sort of a remain, like a Chris Burden talks about that as relics, right? And then he says relics because it's a, it becomes like an archaeological object, the, the remain of the performance. There's an actual action happening. That action is transforming the body in a certain way, and which is important. But the relic is also important because it refers to something that is done and can be imagined in a different way. And also it provides the kind of the opening. Like uh, there's always this uh, talk about the, the documentation of performance, I think, there was a question about that too. Like I think uh, sometimes there's no there's a direct action, and yes, but art is not about art is about always some sort of a uh, remains. I feel this remain can be very temporary, but 
At the same time, there is a remain of it, remaining of it, which can circulate as an oral history because it creates a dialogue around it, right? If there's a performance that can, should not be recorded but can be talked about, it's also a remain. In that sense, it's a relic that should be uncovered. I totally, I mean, I, did, I, will, I will come to the question of being a Turk again because I'm like very excited and like, like I, I, don't, I am not like that, right? When I'm doing art, I'm forcing myself to do something that can, I cannot do otherwise. Like I'm forcing myself to look at something that I am not otherwise like, of I'm, we do, I do, or we do, I mean, we are like that. So for me, this, um, this is a moment that I have to really, really force. And being, like taking the picture was so hard because you're there and you're asking them to pose for you for four minutes, five minutes, whatever. And then you are there. For me, waiting there was the hardest thing because I cannot do anything, right? Or the sh shots are so long that you are just there waiting and you're looking. Some, that is the, I think I feel like I'm transformed by doing that because normally I, would, I won't do that. <laughs> That will be the last one, right? Okay. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> All right. <laughs>